For our final example, we're going to see a summation which requires bounding, as opposed to, opposed to the previous one, which we could have, at some points, at least gotten around bounding. So, just as we've seen in the past, we're going to let t of n be the running time. So, t of n equals runtime. And then we write t of n as a summation. So this is three summations, one for each for loop that goes from one to n. Be careful, two to radical i. Notice again that we ignored the floor function just as we've done in the past because they are tedious. This goes from k equals one to log base two of j. And inside, again, takes constant time. It is basic arithmetic and uh, retrieval and assignment. Just as we've seen in our past several examples, the first summation is going to be easy because there's no variables inside. That may change if the thing inside doesn't take constant time, but for now, it's always has. And the inside is going to be c times log base 2 of j. As we've had to contend with several times in the past, there is no good formula for log base 2 of j. So we now need to bound this above and below, so bound above. To bound it above, we are going to again duplicate our summation, move it down, and then change the color, same thing we've done several times. We're going to bound this above by replacing every term with the largest. Since log is an increasing function, the largest term would be plugging in radical i, so let's do it with that, just like we said. We keep the outer summation untouched, keep the bounds of the second summation untouched, goes from 2 to radical i, and then we replace j with radical i. And now we're going to take the sum and multiply by the number of terms because we have eliminated j from the summation. This goes from 1 to n. The number of terms is radical i minus 2 plus 1, and the inside is c log base 2 of radical i. When bounding this above, I'm going to replace i with n. And notice, I don't really care how messy this expression is. That idea, it doesn't need to be simplified for me to replace i with n. I can always do that. So I can just replace i with n. So this becomes radical n minus 2 plus 1 is minus 1. And then c log base 2 of not n, but radical n. And now I'm going to do two steps at once. I'm going to take the sum and, which no longer has an i inside, and multiply it by the number of terms in the summation. And I'm going to drop that minus 1, because when bounding above, you can always drop negative numbers. So this is less than or equal to n times radical n times c log base 2 of radical n. We're not quite done bounding. But it's really only one step to do, which is combine some stuff and do some arithmetic with that log base 2 of n. Notice off to the side I'm going to comment on, just so we know what algebra I'm going to do. Log base 2 of radical n is log base 2 of n to the 1 half, which I can then bring the 1 half out front. Right, that's log base 2 of n. So we're going to do that, but sort of all in one go here. So this is n to the 3 halves times c, and then we can write that over 2 because of the trick I mentioned off to the side in black there, log base 2 of n. So this is some number, c over 2, times n to the 3 halves log of n. So all the stuff I did in red here is enough to tell me that I am in big O of n to the 3 halves log n. Notice the log base doesn't matter for standing complexity. So we did not include it. So end of the 3 halves log n for the upper bound. We need to now bound below in the exact same way. So let's create our duplicate page and go down there. So we're going to bound below. Let's write that down for the reader so they know what the heck's going on. We bound below. And just as I did in the previous problem, I decided to copy paste ahead of time and recolor it for myself. So to bound below, just like we said in the previous problem, we can combine that step of splitting in half and keeping the larger half into a single step. So the outer summation, again, we do nothing with. We'll leave that as 1 to n. And the inner summation goes from radical i over 2 plus 1 to radical i of c log base 2 of j. We then replace j with radical i over 2 to make it yet smaller still. So that's 1 to n 
and then j going from radical i over 2 plus 1 to radical i of c log base 2 of radical i over 2. And now we can take the inside, which no longer has any j's inside. Remember, you're always looking for the summation index. Therefore, once j has been removed from the problem, that is effectively a fixed quantity, which is being added up a certain number of times, the number of times being the top bound minus the bottom bound plus 1. So this is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of the number of terms, which is the top minus bottom plus 1. We designed it on purpose to be... Radical i over 2, though. We don't even need to compute it. I know that that will simplify to radical i over 2, because that was by design. So, this is c log base 2 of radical i over 2. That's multiplying it. For not so obvious reasons at first, I'm going to do some simplification before we start plugging stuff in to cause myself less pain. In particular, I'm just going to start getting fractions and fractions and fractions if I keep going with this. So, I'm going to comment on some stuff off to the side that I'm going to use, which is radical i over 2 that is inside of that log can be greater than or equal to any power of i that's smaller than 1 half. So I'm going to do i to the 1 third. And you could find out what values of i for which that is true and then try to deduce what we're assuming here. But we've started not really caring so much about those specifics, so we're not going to do that here. So I'm going to do that with only the log term that appears inside of the summation. So, this is greater than or equal to, I'm also going to factor out the c over 2. We have c over 2 times the sum from i equals 1 to n of radical i, doing nothing there, and then log of i to the 1 third. And then just as we did with our radical i in the upper bound, we are going to pull the 1 third out front. So let's do that right now, and then we'll start bounding below again. So this is equal to c over 2 times 1 third. Notice I did two steps in one there. I pulled the 1 third out of the log and then factored it out of the summation, which you can do those two things in one go. Then we have the sum from i equals 1 to n of radical i log of i. Oh, at some point I lost my log base, so let's add those back in. We need a 2 and a 2. And now to bound below, we now have a much nicer looking sum and than we would have otherwise. So this is greater than or equal to, combine the stuff out front into c over 6. And then we have the sum from i equals n over 2 plus 1 to n. of, And then we can replace i with n over 2. This is radical n over 2, log base 2 of n over 2. And now we've eliminated i from the summation. So we, we can then take the number of terms and multiply by the summation. And we get that this is equal to c over 6 times the number of terms, which is n over 2, times radical n over 2, log base 2 of n over 2. Just as we saw when we were bounding before, we are going to do n over 2 is greater than or equal to radical n. And radical n, I'm going to write as n to the 1 half to make my life a little bit easier. So let's do that. And again, we're only going to do that with that term there. And we go that this is greater than or equal to cn over 12 times radical n over radical 2 log base 2 of n to the 1 half. And now we've got a sort of mess of constants to contend with. We have that this is equal to cn to the 3 halves when we take the n times radical n. Then we have 12 times radical 2 times when we bring the 1 half out front. That's another... 1 half log base 2 of n. So we have c over some horrible mess times 1 half times n to the 3 halves log base 2 of n. So all of this junk I just did, yikes, is going to be that we are in omega of n to the 3 halves log n. Therefore, I can need to draw my final conclusion, which is that we are in theta of that same thing. So since t of n is in big O of n to the 3 halves log n, intersect omega n to the 3 halves log n, we know t 
d of n is in theta of the same n to the three halves. Well, again, and we are done at that point. So this problem was symbolically messy. We've seen this before. Radicals can cause things to be symbolically messy. Logs can cause things to be symbolically messy. When you throw them together in a problem like this, it is still symbolically messy. Notice that it's roughly the same as the other problem we did, though, in terms of what we were doing. The functions we plug into change. In this problem, we also did some trickery along the way to make things look nicer. Feel free to do that. Whenever you look at some expression and go, I really don't want to plug into that as written, start bounding. So if you had 4i squared plus 3i plus 8, and you go, that's going to be tedious, bound in some way to make that look nicer. When bounding above, you can make everything look like i squared. When bounding below, you can make everything look like i squared by dropping terms. And both of those things will cause a problem to become severely easier. So this is our last example we're going to do with bounding summations and talking about for loops. We see that... The technique we do could theoretically work for any number of for loops. However, getting beyond three is starting to become tedious to write down and extremely tedious to chug through all of the details and the constants become a bit unwieldy. So for the most part, we'll only ever see three for loops.